Welcome to today's webinar, um, which is all about improving fire safety in our housing stock. I'm Martin Hilditch, the editor of Inside Housing magazine, and uh, the webinar in association with Rockwell is focused on compartmentation uh, in uh, the UK's homes and blocks of flats. Uh, so we've got a fantastic range of panelists lined up to share their experience today, and I'll be introducing them in a mo moment. But first, I'll kick things off with a bit of background to set the scene um, for today. And frankly, you would have to have been living in a cave not to understand the important role that compartmentation plays in preventing fire spread. These are lessons, after all, that date back to at least the Great Fire of London in 1666 and, and beyond. Um, however, while cladding on buildings has received a lion's share of national media coverage over the last two years, comparatively little attention has been paid to compartmentation issues within them. And it's a shame because scrutinizing the way that in which we ensure effective complementation within our buildings is absolutely vital. Both Grenfell and the Lacknell House fires demonstrated failures of internal compartmentation as well as external issues to do with cladding and window panels. In recognition of this crucial issue, today's webinar is a practically focused session looking at how we can improve compartmentation moving forward and better identify existing problems. We want to understand what good practice looks like and what issues and changes people working in the sector should be considering when it comes to their own buildings. We'll be focused on learning and top tips for, for, for providers throughout. And one thing's for certain, it's a moral as well as a legal duty for housing providers to get this right. There's a heck of a lot to get through. Um, so I'll get right on with introducing our panelists today. Um, first up, we'll be speaking to Ian Fraser, the Head of Repairs and Regeneration with Plymouth Community Homes, which has been installing sprinklers in many of its homes and has switched from stay-put policies to full, full evacuation in some of its blocks. Then we'll be getting insight from Tim Vincent, the Head of Technical with Rockwall. And we'll be hearing from uh, some top tips uh, from Niall Rowan, Chief Executive of the Association for Specialist Fire Protection. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from Paul Bussey from Reba's expert advisory panel on fire safety and senior technical consultant at Alford Hall, Monaghan Morris. So um, that's what we've got coming up. Um, and before we start, just a quick reminder that this is an opportunity for everyone in the audience to ask the questions that they really want, really want the answers to as well. Write your questions in the box provided, and our panelists can respond as we go along. And I'll also be picking up on as many of those questions as possible in the question and answer session that will follow the presentations. Right, um, so that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and without further ado, I would like to hand over to Ian Fraser from Plymouth Community Home. So, Ian, it's over to you. Ian Fraser, the head of repairs and regeneration for uh, Plymouth Community Homes. Uh, I'm joined in the room by Paul Bray, who's our uh, fire safety manager, just in case you ask me any really difficult questions and I don't know the answers to them. Um, just really to give you a little bit of context about Plymouth Community Homes, um, this is the breakdown of our properties. Um, as you can see, because we were a, a stock transfer from the local council, we have a big proportion of uh, flats and bedsits and masonettes. So compartmentalisation doesn't really just affect the tower blocks that we have. Um, in some ways, the, uh, the buildings over 18 metres are a little bit easier to manage compartmentalisation because they have concrete floors and ceilings. Um, as far as PCH is concerned, yeah, we have uh, six buildings over 18 metres um, tall. Four of them are 50 years old and the, uh, the other two are um, are 40 years old, so they're, they're old buildings which have been obviously retrofitted over the years. Um, we have, or well, we had, three buildings with uh, ATM cladding on the outside of the buildings. Um, these buildings have been uh, been cladded 20 years ago, um, and we've had fires in the buildings, and the buildings have always done what we expected it to do. So I'll really just give you a little bit of context of where we're to. Obviously, the way we manage fire safety, we have a, a team down here, a dedicated team, which is taking some years to fully populate. Um, as you can see, Paul, who sat, sat with me here, is fire safety manager and has extensive experience in fire, fire safety. Um, and we also have a couple of fire safety supervisors that work for him. And... Before Paul joined us a couple of months ago, we were um, employing the services of CS, Todd and Associates to undertake the fire safety management. They're now going to go to a, an external assurance. I cannot 
overemphasize the need to have competent people. It took me probably five or six attempts to recruit to the fire safety manager. Many of the applicants were not managers. There's people who've done the three or four day um, course in fire and risk fire risk assessment, and they were not able to use. Um, you know, they weren't going to be able to manage QA systems. So this is a real asset to community homes. Okay, this gives us a little bit of background about exactly what we do with the number of flats that we have. Now, our executive team are very supportive. This hasn't just come about recently. They've always been very supportive of anything with compliance. Um, and the, the, the last point about having autonomy to be reactive and make decisions if required, that's incredibly important to us at PCH. As everybody's aware, um, the horrific events on the 14th of June really, really pushed um, the, the, the way that we all approach fire safety. We thought we were, we were good at it, and we, we still believe we were, we were good at it, but we had to challenge and change an awful lot of things, and we had to act very reactively after, um, after the events of that. Uh, so the next slide, that just gives a bit more indication of what we had to do reactively. Okay, um, and what you'll see is on the 22nd of June, the hit and miss executive brick uh, working stairwells have been closed. That was quite a big factor, and they say by nine o'clock the next morning, after getting the results, we were on site dealing with that. Well, this is what I'm referring to as the hit and miss fence. It's, um, we've got a single staircase exit on the three tower blocks. Obviously, once we were became aware of the issues with the cladding on the outside, that posed a serious risk of breach if in the event of a fire. So what we've done is we've actually boarded up with, uh, with uh, treated timber and chip rock to make it a fire barrier so that smoke couldn't come in from outside. On the top floor there, you can see there's a, 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 a locked vent. So if the fire brigade came in, at the event of a fire, they were able to open that vent and put positive pressure in there. But that was some um, compartmentalisation we never had in place. We are we are currently down there working, removing the cladding, and the cladding has been removed. We've opened the top barrier now and the bottom barrier because then that allows for airflow to go through. We've kept the rest of the boarding up just purely to stop um, debris coming through from the EWI work. But we had another complication because with this, um, with boarding off this area, we had the gas main running up through the exit. Now, obviously, I know there's been lots of talk about gas mains and fire, fire escapes. This is steel screwed um, pipe work, so right away you don't have the same impacts as if you had gas soda mains in there. Once we boarded this up, we then had to put uh, gas detection. So just by making something compartmentalised, we still had other factors to con uh, consider, such as other services one in the area. Now these are, I'm moving on to some more general um, examples of issues um, that we we found in regards to compartmentalisation. Obviously the big issue for all of us is fire doors. If you look at the uh, door on the left, the red door, that's one of our doors, which is a 60-minute a, a uh, fire door. The, the one on the right is a tenant, oh, sorry, is a leasehold property. As you can see, they've used wall, they've wallpapered the door. It's artistically very pleasing, but not particularly brilliant for the way that we needed to uh, try and deal with some of the fire safety issues. Um, so we will be taking uh, corrective action or getting the, the lease to take corrective action with dealing that. Right, I mean, this is the inside of that door. So without it being uh, wallpapered, it would be classed as a not notional door. So it doesn't meet current standards, but we have no, we got no legal uh, ways that we could actually expect that lease holder to replace the door. Um, you know, so this is one of the things that we have to work around. Whilst we encourage them to, to take uh, action, we cannot force them to. Obviously, the, the door on the left there was a damaged uh, legal notion of door. So right at that point, we started taking um, we started taking action against the leaseholders if they weren't voluntarily going to replace the doors. In some of our other properties, we've had examples where the uh, leaseholders renewed the door with UPVC. Um, so again, we would take 
uh, action against those leaseholders and uh, force them to change the doors. What we did at PCH, particularly in our tower blocks, is the uh, doors that we were installing were 60 minutes. What we would do, what we did, was we offered um, because they're made by our manufacturing department. We would offer a leaseholder a 60-minute door at the cost of a 30-minute door. So we make up the shortfall so that we have consistency with our fire doors within our uh, tower blocks. Well, we've got the ongoing problem at the moment with replacing fire doors. As you can see, this is what we're, we're fitting uh, when doors are damaged. Um, be, uh, although it's been widely publicised that there are uh, doors, 30-minute doors available now, uh, composite doors, we have found that the... Uh, the accreditation is still a little bit ambiguous and we are still trying to fight our way through and try, before we get uh, clarity on fitting new fire doors. So these are the 60 minute uh, wooden fire doors that we're fitting, which obviously aren't aesthetically pleasing and not and customers don't like them, but we feel that that is the safest way to go at the moment. One of the things that we've also found was that obviously although we were fitting 60 minute fire doors, the actual fan lights above uh, were Georgian glass, which were 30 minutes. And if you look at the picture, you can see that uh, through the frame is the, ga is the gas main going through the property, uh, going into the property. So there's always uh, that's a, a point of weakness if you're actually fitting a 60 minute fire door uh, in, uh, above a, a Georgian wide uh, fan light. In the tower blocks, we've uh, the tower blocks of the cladding, we've been fitting sprinkler systems, and uh, as you can see, we've been replacing the fan uh, the fan uh, lights and making sure that they are sealed and that uh, ensures good compartmentalization. If you see the sticker there, uh, where next where the pipe work goes through, that's informing any tradespeople who are going in afterwards that that is a fire barrier and that they should not be, uh, services should not be taken through there without permission. We have the similar problems that everybody has with riser cupboards and making sure that we get, um, well, obviously, we're, we've been making sure that we're following up and we're making sure that all the um, all the fire stoppings we made good, and that's that's an ongoing um, review. Um, again, with making sure that we've got self closes on the electrical cupboards, I know in many cupboards that we have key meters, and even if we try and lock the doors uh, and ask the residents to unlock uh, lock doors when they're going in and out to put, uh, put money on the meters, they don't always lock the doors, but we did say we make sure that we've got self closes on all electrical coverage now. Some of what we've done, it, uh, sorry, uh, we, we've obviously had ventilation uh, vents around uh, the properties, um, whether it be for the air intakes for uh, warm air systems or, uh, or just general ventilation. We're making sure we've got uh, fire rated intermittent vents on all air circulation units. One of the issues that we also have is we've got refuge chutes and there are um, inspection and warning points around the building. We've had examples where perhaps repairs and maintenance have gone in there and they've not necessarily sealed the, uh, the, the actual panel back properly. Um, they used to be just bolted on. So what we do now is we've made sure that they're, they're locked shut and, and we, try and, we make sure we control access to those uh, chutes. So if we get a blockage um, in one of the chutes, that we're making sure that they are actually locked off um, to prevent smoke entering into the escape. What we had was the um, we couldn't we couldn't make it fire secure, so we built a cupboard around the cupboard. So we built it out and we made sure that it met the current standards and actually that it stopped smoke coming into the uh, into the actual uh, lobbies. So that was really quite a, a good step for us to take. As I said earlier, we've installed sprinklers in all our properties, and it take, took a great deal of effort to do that and make them look um, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, my, my opinion is, because we've uh, been on site virtually for two, over two years now where we've had the cladding and undertaken loads of inspections, we're never going to be able to keep this level of scrutiny up and we still find things. There is no uh, better way of trying to ensure that you've done everything reasonably practical than to install sprinklers. I'm going to show you a very, it's a very quick video and it started on with time lapse. So the lady uh, coming out of the flat had gone into the next door and they then both enter into the flat where the fire is and you'll see, you'll see the bright light from the fire. Um, 
and you can see how effective it was then because we that that fire was extinguished by the time the fire brigade got there. Can you the video, please? I, I, I think there seems to be a, an issue with the, the video the video okay. there, but um, we'll, so we might have to move on to the, the next one. Ian, if, if, if you wouldn't mind just kind of um, r r wrapping it up now as well as a, a bit, just so we can get through through everybody. Sorry, sorry to rush you through because it's um, some really important stuff you're talking us through. But um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just kind of moving towards the the end. Yeah, of no, no. So so, very, well. so like you say, very much. We're you know it, it's a continued battle as we all know, trying to keep up compartmentalisation and. Um, my, my take on it is, yes, we've got to do it. We can show what's reasonably practical, but I would urge people to install sprinklers in high-rise uh, high buildings. Thank you. That's fabulous, and we'll definitely be coming on to sprinklers later as well. I've got, got a lot to ask about them, and we've been campaigning to get them installed in, in blocks of um, flats too. Um, right, we uh, th thank you very much, uh, Ian, for a great, great presentation there. I'm going to move straight on to um, Tim Vincent. Head of technical with Rockwall. So, Tim, it's over to you. Tim, you there? I am there. I am here. <laughs> Tim, it is over to you. Uh, okay. So, yeah, please take it away. Thank you. This, these few slides are part of a, a much larger hour-long uh, CPD that we offer, which goes into much more detail. So if anybody would sort of like more, then I'm sure you can contact either either myself or, or go through Inside Housing to sort of have the, have the full version of it. Um, we, we're a non-combustible stonewall insulation manufacturer. Primarily, we do boards for um, roofing for walls, but we also provide um, products for both fire stopping um, and protection. Um, and we will sort of cover some of those shortly. A really quick whistle-stop tour through through, through um, fire. You need three items uh, in order for a fire to ignite, the fuel, the oxygen, or the heat. And if you remove one of these, then uh, you will stop the ability for the fire to ignite. If a fire, fully developed fire can happen in five minutes. Temperatures can quickly exceed 800 degrees, um, but co correct compartmentation slows the spread of the fire. And we've already seen some sort of real life pictures uh, from Plymouth in the presentation earlier. Um, fire protection and fire stopping. So it's just some key points of why we do why we do this side. So it's to protect the structure of the building, so the load bearing elements in there. Divide the building into fire resistant compartments, so to con continue the fire separation performance, to provide integrity and insulation resistance, and there's a couple of slides coming up to explain those. Um, and also to inhibit the passage of fire and the byproducts of combustion, so smoke primarily, and there's obviously been a lot of, uh, lot of that aspect in the press um, recently. So fire protection, fire stopping. So so protects the, the structure of the building, the load bearing elements. You can see a, a diagram there showing some of our products protecting a, a beam there. Um, but it provides fire protection for structural elements from the effect of high temperatures that can be generated in a fire, which could then weaken the steel and cause structural collapse. So the main aims are, I say, to prevent building collapse, maintain the compartmentation, facilitate the escape uh, of the residents or the occupiers of the building, but also for the fire brigades and the fire service to fight the fire, and also to ultimately reduce the damage, because if the building doesn't collapse, you get the people out, you never know what you can actually save, although obviously if people people's life is by far the uh, most important uh, factor here. Um, the construction types that we, we particularly cover are steel, concrete uh, and timber. So divide the building into fire resistant compartments. So I won't cover too much of this because I haven't got too long, but um, um, we have fire rated walls and, uh, and floors. Um, everything has an insulation and integrity rating. Again, I will come to that shortly. But the fire resistance requirements depend on certain key features. It is not a one sort of um, one solution fits all. It's you have to look at the building type, the application, the area and the usage of the building the occupation levels, uh, the height of the building, and there's obviously been a lot of uh, discussion around that recently. Um, and again, I keep hammering home this message to provide continuation of the fire separation. So the integrity and, and the insulation. So fire performance is measured for, and again, you can please take a little look at some of the diagrams, but you've got the EI rating and the S. So integrity being the E, insulation being the I and stability being S. And when we come to see some test reports at the end, this will hopefully make a little bit more sense for those who, who may not sort of get too involved it, it within this uh, sort of world. 
coming back to one quick slide on, we talked about the byproducts, so primarily the, the smoke of this. So with compartmentation and the testing that we do, you also get ratings for a product to not only protect from the flames and ultimately the heat going through, but also to stop the byproducts such as the smoke. Um, and there's some slightly scary sort of uh, fact here, but smoke inhalation is the most likely cause of death during a fire. Um, and we've got some DCLG, as it was then, stats from 2013-14 to say that 41% of fire-related deaths in Great Britain for that period were caused by gas, smoke and toxic fumes. Again, there's two different types of, of gases, the, ex the exfixient gases and also the irritant. Easy for me to say, I know. But uh, these are all different types that can impede the escape and ultimately render the uh, inhabitants of that building incapable of escaping whilst also causing the fire service extreme issues in terms of getting in and their visibility once they're in within the building. So the fire protection again coming back to this particular slide it looks at the insulation the integrity and the stability that is what our non-combustible materials will help provide um, in terms of uh, those particular features. We take a rock, we melt it down, we spin it, and that is actually what creates our products, which give them the excellent fire qualities and non-combustible features that they have. Structural potential, again, cavity barriers um, is another range that we do. Again, this is all available on our website or the, the larger CPD, so I won't touch too much on it because I know we've got a lot to, to get through here. Fire stopping, again, you have a firewall, you've got to break through the compartmentation because as you can see in the diagram, you have your pipes, data cables, um, sprinkler pipes, as I'm sure we'll come on to a bit later on, but also your other um, HVAC and other issues that go through. Um, the correct insulation integrity rating when you make that wall back to provide the fire resistance uh, and fire stopping rating that it was originally given is vitally important. And you can see one of our, our coated bats there, which goes through extensive testing. Gain some different applications, just teasing to make people sort of think and just to show the different types of products, but also the different scenarios that you might come out there uh, across there. So the linear gaps in the seals, penetration void fillers, but also the pipework and trunking of which um, whenever we see buildings, it just seems to get more and more um, within these particular products. Pipes seem to be getting more numerous. Cables seem to be getting more numerous as well, particularly as we uh, as, as technology advances uh, with uh, industry, etc. So reaction to fire versus resistance to fire. Again, the integrity, so let's sort of have a little look at that. So the integrity of uh, the insulation is the ability to remain free of cracks, holes or openings outside the compartment in which the fire is present. So this is quite vital for when we are actually testing. And again, I'll show you some of the ratings in, in a test report towards the end. The insulation, it's the ability to maintain the integrity without developing temperatures on its external surface. So if you picture the fires on the internal surface, there can only be a set temperature rise on the external surface, and that has to be below a certain rise, which is quoted there, I won't go through all the numbers. If it is outside the scope of that, then the insulation rating will only achieve whatever it has actually managed to achieve. So here we go. This is a field of assessment report. Again, for, for those of you who perhaps perhaps all, you all are used to looking at these, my apologies, but for those of you who might not be uh, used to looking at these, this is for one of our products, our, our soft seal um, particular product. So within the field of assessment report, which you can receive from, from manufacturers, um, they will be, the assessment is readily sent out. You can see the EI rating to see here exactly what this particular product achieved. Now, it doesn't necessarily jump out at you, but this is something that you should be looking for within the classifications. Um, most manufacturers or all manufacturers will offer this, but we certainly, if you need to have this discussed through or, or, or talk through and walk through a report, then please just give us a call and we can talk you through, let you understand a bit more or far more in depth than I'm talking now about the testing to hopefully give you the confidence of what this actually means within the report. So the best practice is to combine with installation by third party proof installers, because we as a manufacturer, we can produce the best products and we can do the best testing we can. But if uh, it's then installed incorrectly, what was the point of what we've done? So third party approved installers is a, is a key route when you're going through um, your fire stopping strategies. 
We as a business provide fully tested solutions. Um, and here's an example of one of our um, standard details. So this particular build up will have gone through testing uh, with a UCAS accredited test house. We will then be given the result documents. We will then um, produce our standard detail, which then can be sort of an off the shelf solution for a particular scenario you have within the building. We have a very comprehensive um, standard details pack, which is available on our website. Um, and some of the benefits here as you can see, it's a fully tested solution, clear installation notes um, for your third party approved installer, um, product compatibility. So everything that you see there is actually what was tested. It gives clear fire performance data, no need for EJs. EJs are engineering judgments. So you have a test and an engineering judgment might be if something is ever so slightly outside of the scope of a test or a, a, a fire um, sort of a, opinion, should we say, far more than an opinion, but by using a fire, a fully tested solution, you know exactly what you're getting. And simplified specification. We're not currently trying to do something further down the line um, because it wasn't considered early on. So to wrap up, um, incorporating fire safety from a design stage. I appreciate I'm talking very much about sort of new builds here as much as anything else, um, but buildings are considered as a system which in order to satisfy, uh, in order to safe requires every aspect of design, construction, refurbishment, maintenance to prioritize safety. That came out of the Hackett report and that is something that is vitally important. Um, again, some more Hackett quotes here for you. Deliver and maintain safety integrity throughout the life cycle of a building. So not just when it was installed or um, retrofitted because of some particular issue. And ensure that the golden thread of information persists throughout the building life cycle. So we provide stuff at the start um, and the gentleman before me who runs you know, properties for Plymouth Homes, if the golden thread of information is there, then you should be able to see somewhere exactly what is within that building, hopefully making people's lives far easier as these buildings get older. Um, on my final wrap-up slide, so understand your role and liability for fire protection and remember the following key points and I apologise for reading them off the screen but they're, they're important to summarise. Treat the building as a system as I just mentioned. Consider, for, consider fire protection and incorporating third party approved materials from the outset. Incorporate fully tested standard details into your design and utilise third party accredited products and installers. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Lots, lots of stuff to get our teeth into um, uh, a little bit later on. Um, thank you. And sure, to our audience, um, uh, absolutely. And to our audience, can I just a quick reminder? There's a Q and A uh, uh, box, so please ask questions as we go along, um, and our panelists can can, can pick them up as, as we um, as we move along. Hi, Paul. Are you are you there? Martin, can you hear Somebody's me now? On. Who, I, I can hear you. Is that uh, Paul, Paul sorry, Bussey? That Paul Bussey speaking, or is that uh, Niall? Paul, Paul you, you, yeah. you, were beat, you were beaten Niall to it. It's, right. Uh, great okay. Call. I've got uh, my well, slides welcome. up there. Um, Thank you. Good. Uh, in which case, we will hand straight over to you. Apologies for the technical issues there, but Paul, it is over to you. Excellent. Thanks. Not quite sure what the um, the IT was doing there, but um, we're here. So um, Paul Bussey, AHMO Architects. Um, we're working with the RBA to try and help resolve this, this issue of, of which compartmentation is obviously the major one. Um, I'm just going to see if I can move the slides on myself. Yeah, we, we initially started off, as many of you have seen, Edinburgh schools, um, massive structural problems and defects in the building. It also turns out there's massive fire problems as well that were, were established as a consequence. So as a team, we started analysing these problems and a huge number of defects became very apparent. Um, working with the ASFP, of which Niall will be speaking later, um, it's pretty clear not only building defects of efflorescence and leakage, but you know, huge def defects, which it seems pretty much our industry are very difficult or finding very difficult to resolve. We as an organisation, together with the RSCS and the CIOB, have tried to put together a building in quality memorandum where responsibility for quality is everybody's um, bag. It's not just something that everyone else does. We've got to all take responsibility. Um, and so certainly work with Nile and various other um, Hilti and other organisations and Waits contractors, we've tried to put together um, a team which was actually pre-Grenfell um, but when we actually got into the Grenfell inquiry and, and, and listening to what was going on there, architects have been writing on our drawings for years, 120 minutes for a fire core, 60 minutes enclosure compartmentation for flats. 
And, and to be frank, our assumption was the industry can deliver that. It's now become very clear that actually it can't be delivered or for some reason it isn't delivered. And we're trying to get to the bottom of that. And, uh, and I don't necessarily think it's, it's anyone's fault, but it's a combination. And, and it, it, all of us have let this happen on our, on, our, um, on our patch, so to speak. So how do we move on from there? We've all got to work together. And, and certainly Niall will endorse this. ASFP have got some great information, but it's pretty clear it's not getting out there to the right people. Um, I'm, I've just had an email, so something else has happened, sorry, but I can continue. Um, so how do, we, how do we get together as an industry to, to improve this? We, we know that fire doors can be brilliant, but if they're not properly installed, they're not properly um, specified, we've got problems. And, and we know that they can be damaged by users and in use. So how can we, how can we get over that? Again, ASFP have got loads of pictures of seals and door closers which don't comply. Um, they're, they're retrofitted. Even the fixings and the installations are not properly um, sorted. So we're trying to get our members to understand this process, spot this on site. One thing that's become very clear, though, and I would put this slide in particularly, that frankly, every housing block, because of in the, the, the community care um, scenario that the NHS and the government have imposed on us, every housing block is a care home. So we not only have people who are ambulant and um, in, the, in the full flash of life, we've got young children, we've got elderly people, we've got people with disabilities we've got to consider. So we're actually spread, extending the net, I think, to actually consider things perhaps more than, than Grenfell is actually looking at. And so when you look at the Grenfell core, we have this core with all the smoke, as in the dots um, logging it, which comes from the fire in the bottom left-hand corner. But the fact is, any of those doors not only could be not suitably in, in, in absolute integrity, they could be open. They're, they haven't got a door closer. Even a body was, a body was propping one of these doors open, um, amazingly. Which, com which conflicts that whole lobby, in, into which people are supposedly waiting for a firefighting lift because they're, they're disabled, or the fire brigade are coming up and trying to fight the fire. So that whole lobby is compromised. So we're very strongly looking at having compartmentation in that green zone in the middle, which actually protects people who are vulnerable, wheelchair users, children, and firefighters who need some protection from the fire, heat, etc., and getting away from the smoke and fire or on other floors. And we think that is a very important part of additional compartmentation to existing buildings. Um, can't do that in all. And so we're getting back to the actual compartmentation. This diagram is just showing the sort of size of hole, number of services, and that increases exponentially. Don't have to read the text. So the RBA are taking on board the um, plan of work, as we call it, trying to look at everybody's role in this process, making sure the gateways are shown vertically in the dotted red red lines to actually encourage um, the proper gateways that, that Julia Hackett is asking for, and making sure the right design decisions are made before those gateways, rather than afterwards when they don't they don't happen, or they're not built as designed. And that is very often the case. We, 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 have, we have design drawings, they're not followed, or the patch of the drawings aren't there in the first place or they're not adequate. So again, the, finally, this, this sort of shows the slide from a competence perspective, showing the new gateways that are expected by Judith Hackett and the, uh, the new recommendations down the bottom right-hand side, and where all the different duty holders are going to be expected down the middle to provide the competent works, competent sign-offs, and then if we are the principal designer, we will be in a position to say, yes, we're happy. That has been third party approved and we'll sign that off. We cannot possibly do that ourselves as architects or as principal designers. So that's part of the discussion and we're very happy to engage with that further. I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. That, that was an absolutely fascinating talk and um, some, some really important issues to, to, for, for, for providers to consider there. Um, and I, I think the, the, the issues around staircases as well really, um, really, really important moving moving forwards. Thanks, so, Martin. Um, thank, thank, thank you very much there. Right, I, I am going to, to now, with a bit of luck, um, sorry we've moved out, out of order there, Niall, uh, uh, Niall Rowan is the Chief Executive of the Association for Specialist Fire Protection. My name is Niall Rowan. I am the Chief Executive Officer for the 
Association for Specialist Fire Protection. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about the vital role of passive fire protection and installing buildings. Um, the ASFP is a trade association of manufacturers and installers of passive fire protection products. Uh, as you can see, we're growing quite well. But we also have involved the testing and certification bodies, all the UCAS accredited bodies are also available. Um, and because of that, that's why we started back in 1979, in order to increase the quality of built-in passive fire protection. So the first production, the first combination we, the publication we produced was our ASFP Yellow Book, which is all about the fire protection or, or straps for steel. And the reason that was done was because there were various completing claims and manufacturers, and it was it was a bit confusing out there for end users. So the Yellow Book was followed fairly swiftly by the Red Book, which is our guide to fire stopping. And I'm sure you'll be uh, not surprised to know that that's one of the most popular downloads. We have a guide to passive fire protection specifically for fire risk assessors and uh, um, amongst other things a library of youtube visits uh, videos okay so what am i going to talk about here i'm not going to talk about cladding or insulation so you'd be pleased to know that i'm going to talk about passive fire protection and when we when we look at grenfell that says leaked report in 2018 but as you as you know and from uh, the the testimony from various people to the public inquiry, including Barbara Lane. There was unsuitable fire stopping around the windows. The photograph in the bottom right, it used to, it's a window and you can see some scaffolding in the reflection uh, in the window. But to the right, it's a kind of solid black line, which is actually uh, a fifth 150 millimeter gap, which was sealed with rubber a membrane rigid foam and, P and UPVC. So basically that means the fire will get straight out from, yeah, into the into the cladding straight away. So there's you know, very poor fire stopping. Um, other speakers have already mentioned about fire doors, issues with replaced, closures removed. So even when the fire doors are there, they're ineffective. And issues with 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 composite doors. And I just thought I'd make this in this report, you know, with a lot of this, the fire sector has been saying things about buildings like Grenfell and before that Lepinal House for a long time and that's a report that we wrote in 2003 paid for by the government um, so you know they can't say they weren't warned um, so but it's not all bad um, you know the the, the uh, this fire and this block of flats in Birmingham uh, occurred in 2017 two weeks after Grenfell um, it was a fire in, a, in, in what we would now call a herb, a high risk residential building. Uh, it's quite a severe fire. The fire, the, the flat was completely burnt out. Um, but the, the the area commander allowed people to leave the building, although it had a state of policy because of what had happened at Grenfell. He allowed people to leave the building uh, and that um, no one was injured. But the main point to make in regard to this presentation was the building's design, which completed compartmentation of individual flats, performed as it does in the vast majority of cases. Um, so just be aware, you know, it's not that it never happens. On the other hand, am I going to say everything in the in the garden is rosy? No, I'm not. And and here is some of my stash of passive fire protection pornography. I'm afraid. Up top left is a foam a PU foam from a ten years used in a riser cupboard. That's not fire resisting and it was not low bearing either. Uh, the bottom left is a wall that never made it to the ceiling. Uh, the central picture is a gap between the back of the door frame and the wall sealed with the, 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 the famous shoes that one uses to walk around swimming pools, etc. Um, they're not actually fire resisting despite what you might think to the contrary. Top right is the fire alarm, and you can see the panel has been sealed with foam. And bottom right, um, uh, it's a new type of fire protection. We call this is invisible fire protection because, unfortunately, it's not there. So, our, our, you know, I've just to pick up from one of Tim's point. We're great believers. We at the ASFP are great believers in third-party certification. And what third-party certification? It says it there. It's a guarantee of the product or service 
for the stakeholder and it's independent. So it's not me saying my product is really good. It's the certification body saying it's good. It's not me saying I'm a really good installer. It's the certification body auditing uh, my procedures and inspecting my work. So the third party certification is, is very, it's quite prevalent, but it's very prevalent in certain parts of, of fire protection. All the fire trade associations want it. That's the active people, the sprinkler people, the fire industry association for detectors and alarms. It's not, it's not just the ASFP. We're very keen at we think we think it, it's it offers a lot. Um, and to say there's two basic types: the certification of products, the certification of installers. And there's there's, there's a list of bullet points there. And as you can see, they are almost identical. The only difference is the product certification is sold to the manufacturers, where it's an audit of the manufacturers, um, uh, factory production control system, etc. whereas the certification installers is an audit of the staff undertaking the work. Um, so why we need certification of installers, um, I'm afraid you've seen that photograph before, so that's one that Paul had. Um, and the reason for that photograph is that Ockergang's primary school in Edinburgh is that um, it's to show that the problems of the construction industry, they're often not fire problems, they're construction industry problems. And there's a case where construction errors are not seen, get, get hidden away, and they don't find out. So what happened at the Oxfam School, in case you didn't, don't remember, it's a couple of years ago now, three years ago now, uh, that wall blew down in the outside, that wall blew down in a storm in the middle of the night in January. And it happened at six other schools because the wall ties between the inner and outer leaves weren't long enough. So why didn't they use longer ones? And it still be found out. So it's a failure of inspection. And that's one of the messages that I would make put to you to anybody who's in charge of housing, make sure you get compartment education audit done as part of your fire risk assessment. And when they went into Oxgang's school, this is what they found. This is not really surprising, so compartmentation missing there. Uh, finally, I'd just like to mention some bits about maintenance. Uh, maintenance is quite important. This is a sticker uh, put on a compartment wall by one of our members, Avesta, in Scotland. Um, uh, and what it says is, stop fire compartment wall, do not penetrate. And the next photograph shows that sticker. You can probably just see it above that huge great hole that somebody's cut in a fire barrier. Uh, and we see this all, all the time. So, you know, follow on trust. So, you, you might think, I've done my compartmentation audit, my building is fine. A year later, it probably won't be because people get in there and they start putting, cutting holes and doing things. So, you need to keep on top of it. Uh, here's another one, it's another example of a large hole that's in a very large building. And here's our, a goal system, some good, good old fashioned fire door photographs. The left hand one is the view through the meeting edge. Of, of two doors, so you can actually you can see through it. It's not it's certainly not going to stop smoke and popping up fire. And the right hand one is around the door frame. Uh, this one is a fire door, which as you can see has been replaced with duct tape where the glass is missing. So that's not going to work either. And some other bits and pieces there. More foam, the hinges on the right hand side are broken, and voids on the left hand side. So, uh, to uh, what I want to say to you is the key messages are. Do a compartmentation audit where necessary, in fact, every year. Uh, make sure the passive fire protection is inspected and use third-party certificated contractors to install third-party certificated products. And that's me over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Niall. Uh, really, really appreciate that. And um, again, really, really important issues uh, raised and um, lots of food for thought for people to take away. Um, so we are now... Um, uh, moving on to the Q&A, which I'll, I'll, I'll run just a little bit longer than, than we originally planned because of the technical issues we've had today. So apologies um, for, for that to everybody. So yes, we'll, we'll um, move on to the, um, the Q&A now. Um, uh, so we've heard from, from all of our pre uh, presenters um, and I just wanted to, to pick up. There's a question that, that's um, been asked in the audience um, and I might um, chat to Ian about that. Um, uh, but it's, it's, the, the question is, um, has anyone created a permit to work system for compartmentalization to restrict contractors installing services for compromising integrity? Uh, integrity? We're looking to implement a system for any contractor who creates uh, penetration such as uh, communication, plumbing and service provision. It would be interesting to see how we can control fire stopping works 
via this method. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I will. Uh, Ian, is this something that you've you've been doing? Is this is this something that that uh, you've been considering? Um, it's got something we've been we've been actually doing. Um, obviously, we've got a we've been on site on the ones with the uh, on the three blocks of the ACM. So we it's now controlled quite a bit. We're, we're really concerned about the practicalities going forward, and particularly on how we're going to address uh, the buildings. Because unless you've actually got somebody monitoring who's going in and out the the building, you'll never know. Uh, particularly because they don't necessarily work for us. They could be working for a leaseholder. They could be part of a utilities organisation. So, whilst we could implement it, I'm not quite sure how it would be effective. Understood. Thank, thank you very much for that, um, Tim. I'm going to bring bring you in now. And I, I, I guess what I what I'd also like to ask, because you know we're we're running relatively short short on time, is um, uh, so you know considering that question, but also if if people can make you know, one change, if there's one thing they, they should be taking away from today and, and going and thinking about what, what, what should they be picking up on, what's the kind of central central message for you from, from today? So, yeah, Tim, if you wouldn't mind coming in. No, sure, not, not at all. I say hopefully you can hear me after the issues. Um, it's, I think Niall and I might cross over quite a bit here, but it's it, it, it's inspect what you have. If, if we're talking retrofit and existing buildings, which we seem to be a lot here, is, is to have the sound advice of what you've you've actually got there. We we as a manufacturer are getting a lot of noise at the moment of of how do people know um, what products they're actually looking at. Um, you know, cause it could be one of ours, it could be somebody something else's, um, and that's something that we as a, as a manufacturer and industry are, are looking at. But but is, is there a big problem with pro product substitution, Tim? I mean, that's something we've heard of in Australia. Um, you know, is, is that um, so? Yeah, is, is that an issue in this in this country as well? Is, is that likely to be a big issue moving forward? Product substitution is is, is a big issue everywhere. Um, the, the issue here is because we are for once talking about a, a system and a tested system. If you substitute one of those single things out, then you, it's no longer a tested system. You know, if if you don't use the the correct mastic, for example, you know you go and buy a, a one pound tube from Wilkinson's or any other shops are available then then obviously you've just completely ruined the, the, the test side of it so so yes it, it is vital that every component that is installed in that system is exactly what was tested and that is that is key to checking as well because the the worst scenario is you look at something and you think yep that looks brilliant that's a top job it looks like the insula it looks like the picture but how are you 100% certain that, that the materials that are used um, within that, um, what you're looking at, is actually what was in the test, which I appreciate is is, is a tough job. Right. Thank, thank you very much, Tim. Um, Paul, I will move to you with the same question, um, and I'm ho hoping you're online given our technical issues earlier. So, Paul, um, yeah, if, pe if people are going to go away from this with, with um, you know, one or two things to look at, what what should what should they be? What what should our big takeaways um, be from today? I'm afraid our technical issues with with Paul seem to have returned, unfortunately. So um, sorry about that. Um, so I will try um, and move um, back on uh, to uh ian with that question so again ian the takeaways from from this what what, what would you be your big takeaway um for people the, the kind of number one thing that people should be looking at after kind of um moving away from the session this morning um i think i think there's two things um one is the maintenance the future maintenance i also manage the um dlo and one of the concerns that I've got is we put the responsibility on chippies and frontline workforce to fit the right um, letter boxes and things like that. So what we've we've made, taken a step, we've stopped fitting them. Uh, you know, with it with it being replaced and maintenance, whether we we over spec it and fit it to houses and things like that, we're trying to reduce the the number amount of selection for operatives repairs operatives to make. Um, I think that's quite important because you think that you've done a good job and you and then something gets broken and a repairs operative goes in for something completely different in. So that that's one of my big concerns. Um, and again, a lot of the focus of my presentation was around the uh, the towers where we're we've had the ACM and we're removing that. We we've been on site every day since 
since pretty much since Grenco. First of all, installing, uh, doing rem instant remedial works, then doing fire alarms, now sprinklers, and now we're doing the ACM, uh, removing the ACM. That's not sustainable long term, um, and it's very much about how do you make, you know, how do you keep the compliance up? Um, because as, as soon as you check it, something can be undone. And like you say, we have lots of issues with BT engineers and uh, gas, people with gas, blow torches going in, changing meters, and we, we've got no control over that. So I'm a lot more comfortable with the sprinkler system in those three towers. And it is our intention over the next three years to install sprinkler systems in our remaining towers. Um, now I do appreciate for other organizations who've got a lot more high rise blocks than us, that may not be feasible. But it is something that I do feel that we're reasonably practically dealing with by, have, by having that extra control measure in place. Martin, can you hear Thank me now? Thank you very much there. I, I can hear you now, and I, I will move to, you, move to you next, Paul. Okay. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, Ian. And um, yeah, I just kind of second those, those uh, calls for um, sprinklers as well, because um, certainly that's some, something that Inside Housing has been campaigning on over the last couple of years um, and would like to see, see more movement on there. Um, yes, Paul, so same, same question, perhaps to, to round things off, because I think we've been having some Yeah, tech, tech I, I can remember it. Um, so yes, uh, the, the big takeaway, so yeah. Um, from from our perspective at the RIBA, um, as much as we want to improve the understanding of these issues of our members, which we're working with the ASFP particularly in in an excess of um, CPD next year, uh, but that is one point. But but I think the reinstatement of Clarks of Works, which one of your colleagues we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, third party accreditation, Clarks of Works were got rid of in the Thatcher era. She did some good things, but that was wasn't one of them. Um, getting rid of them, and and actually that whole process is undermined the quality of our buildings and and I think clients and contractors have got to be aware that this is going to have to happen whether they call clerks of works or whether they're called um, quality assessors I don't know but someone's got to be there making sure what we've designed assuming we've got it right is actually built and and actually the I wouldn't say the demise of design build but this issue of changing things because it's because the contractor knows best um, has got to stop and we've got to get back to a system of full plans approval any changes now we've got to stop the job why are you changing it um, and I think that is fundamentally important otherwise we're going to continue what we currently have did you get that and are, are we moving I, we, we got that, and are, are we moving quickly enough? Is the, is the next question because it sounds well, like still the Guardian quite a doesn't to think go. so, do we? And, and two years on, it's surprising. You know, we've got some changes. The regulations, the, there's only regulation seven that's really been changed. It's now been backed up by ADB. Okay. Nothing else has been changed, frankly, in any consequence. And, and and certainly, we're being told we've got to do what is right by the MHCLG. But we think actually we've got to be given some more prescriptive legislation. Otherwise, things won't change. They'll end up with being value engineered, fire engineered, and the lowest common denominator will will continue to apply. So we think some more prescriptive legislation is fundamental. Otherwise, we don't get change. Thank, thank you very much. And I, th I think that's um, a, a really powerful point um, uh, to, to draw to a, to a close. Apologies, we've had some technical problems today um, with uh, Paul and, and Niall in, in particular. So um, yeah, apologies to, 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 to both uh, both of you. Um, but we got we got through the presentations, and there were some really um, important takeaways within them. So um, those presentations are available afterwards, and we'll be distributing the webinar as well. So um, do. Do look through uh, as the audience, um, but it just remains for me to thank all <coughs> all of our presenters today, Paul, Tim, um, uh, Ian, and Niall. So thank you all very much for taking part. Thank you all very much for tuning in, and um, yes, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.